last time we, uh, as you know, I, I am so happy to offer this three part class on what's happening in photography nowadays. And it's anybody who attempts that would tell you that it's an impossible challenge to cover so much ground. So as you know, I'm last class, we sort of quote, looked backwards, we took a look at um, photographers using analog traditional photography to make fresh new work. So I, I never want my classes to have a bias. Uh, so let's let the pendulum swing forward today and take a look at great art being done with state of the art technology. And you can see in this first uh, title, I've highlighted the word creative because uh, I really don't want this uh, session to be simply about technology for technology's sake. So we're not gonna talk about scientific photography in the labs. We're gonna take a look at people who make use of uh, the latest equipment um, and technology and photography to continue making really creative uh, work, self-expression. And, you know, speaking of digital imaging, uh, digital photography has literally changed the world. You know, every phone we have has a camera and it's been estimated that there are more phones in the world than there are people. Uh, and certainly since the advent of digital photography, we've had an explosion of, of imagery. Here's just a little excerpt from the New York Times, which is woefully out of date. Back in 2015, they were remarking about an explosion of digital photography. This year, 2015, and you can practically double it, I kid you not, each year uh, imagery goes up, uh, the pictures that we take goes up exponentially. But in 2015, uh, the Times estimated um, that uh, we would take more than a trillion photos in 2015. Believe me, it's probably 50% uh, more than that now. Um, and check this out. This is a little something I added here. Uh, each day, each day today, we'll take more pictures uh, uh, combined on planet Earth than were taken in all of the 19th century. So it's just incredible the uh, what digital imaging affords us Years ago, this is about a 15 year old article. This is so passe now, and I'll show you plenty of artists, including Ted, who, who are so far beyond this cliche. But years ago, when, when digital photography was just coming on the scene, Photoshop was just released. Uh, there was a big article that showed this, this hilarious, you know, overly hokey image of flying, flying saucers going through San Francisco. And, you know, this big headline, did, they called it digital retouching, the end of photography as evidence of everything, which is possibly true. Uh, you know, uh, as usual, I'm gonna go on a limb today and you can saw it off on me with my generalizations. But it is true that from day one in the history of photography, people have been manipulating. If you look back in the 19th century, you'll see spirit photography with these really hokey double exposures of of auras around people's head, you know, really low tech back in the 1860s. So manipulation is, is nothing new to photography. So one could argue that photography has, ne has never been, you know, uh, irrefutable evidence of anything since we've been able to tamper with it from, from its invention. But I think we can all agree that digital imaging makes it so much easier to take a picture of the world which comes up as pixels on your screen. And then it's, it's, it's fairly easy to just move these pixels or bring in new pixels into an image. So today let's talk about manipulation for a little bit. Uh, and I have to give credit to one of Ted's best friends uh, who lives in Florida, I forget his name, but there has been a guy and you all probably have already guessed who I'm talking about since he's one of the uh, most celebrated living photographers on planet Earth, no kidding. One of, one of the probably top three or five most celebrated and respected fine art photographers living. And this guy has been in his darkroom with five or six or seven enlargers uh, for almost 50 years. Uh, making impossible scenes. 
and only recently has digital photography come along. But I want to give credit to uh, this guy, Jerry Ulsman, who without digital cameras or Macintosh computers or Photoshop has been doing incredible things. And Ted's actually going to give us a, a deeper view of his pal who he just visited about a year ago out in Florida. But you know, here we have a black and white silver gelatin photograph, beautiful, beautiful prints. Uh, this is, these were made uh, 40 years before anybody uttered the term uh, digital imaging, I'm, I'm generalizing, but decades before digital photography was invented. You know, these impossible scenes, what you're looking at are film, film camera pictures made. Jerry developed his film like all the rest of us do in the darkroom uh, and then puts these negatives in enlargers and shines them down, in this case, three, four, five different negatives each in its own enlarger shines each negative down onto a black and white piece of photo paper, just creating impossible scenes, which, which has led him to be one of the most celebrated photographers in, in late 20th century photography. Jerry Yulsman was, uh, I'll give you the academic uh, background and then Ted will talk about real life in just a minute. But Jerry Yulsman was born in 1934 uh, he got his BFA at, at Rochester Institute of Technology in 1957, uh, studying with Minor White, lucky him, and he got his MFA at Indiana University in 1960. So I kid you not, this guy has been in the photography world for decades. He taught for many, many years at the University of Gainesville in Florida. And let me, I'm going to turn this over to Ted in just a second, but I want to, uh, again, give you just an academic uh, setup here by quoting Jerry. Jerry says, the mind knows more than the eye and the camera can see. He says, I try to begin working with no preconceived ideas. My contact sheets become a kind of visual diary of all the things I've seen and experienced with my camera. They contain the seeds from which my images grow. So here's just a tiny glimpse of uh, Jerry's darkroom that Ted has stood in many, many times. Note the multiple enlargers. Each enlarger has its own negative. Jerry moves the one piece of photo paper from one enlarger to the next, very, very uh, skillfully, really burning and dodging putting all those images onto the same piece of photo paper. And with that, Ted O, oh, if you're ready to give us more up-to-date information, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Does that sound good? I just put together a little string of uh, about a dozen pictures I have of Jerry that uh, just sort of jumping off points and maybe Brian will hop back in with some of his comments at the same time. Jerry is one of my very favorite people. I met Jerry for the first time in, I believe, 19, this is either 1968 or 1969. And Jerry had flown west. This was his first trip to Point Lobos for a workshop that the Friends of Photography was offering. And it was uh, pretty, pretty expensive and exclusive. There were, I think, only about 15 of us who enrolled. And it was um, two days at Point Lobos with Ansel Adams and Imogene Cunningham and Jerry Yulesman, but the, the tuition was a whopping $10. So you had to think twice before you did this. So this is Jerry being awarded the, honor, the title of honorary West Coast photographer on the occasion of his first visit to Weston Beach Point Lobos. And uh, I like it mainly because I got all those key words like Weston and Weston Beach and you know all these people in the, in the same title. Be, the, be that as it may, the thing, one of the things I love about Jerry is he has this wonderful sense of humor, which you sense to some degree in his pictures, but just the living self is the same way. This is up in Yosemite during one of the Yosemite workshops. We were, I was Jerry's driver and we were driving across the valley and all of a sudden he spots this floating tree out there in the, in the middle of the meadow and we just threw the car into the ditch and ran across the meadow and Jerry got out his uh, long shot gun there. 
and uh, brought down this floating tree, which is sort of sort of indicative of the way that he likes to think about the whole world. Uh, another time we were up in the Napa somewhere in the in the vineyards, and Jerry was doing his best imitation of the of the winter vineyards at that point. And then over time, uh, I guess I get I get rolling on these stories and things, and I really have to force myself to slow down and just say as a as a grand overview that. Um, Jerry had a wonderful influence on my life as a photographer. Uh, I came in, I, as I met him back in 69 or so, he came to a workshop in a little bit later than that in Yosemite. And um, at some point, um, I remember sitting in his room and we were looking, all, all the group of people, we were all looking at prints and passing them around and, and Jerry looked at mine and said a few nice things. And then, then later, uh, he came over and said, uh, you know, I don't know how you'd feel about this, Ted. And of course, he's calling me Ted and I'm thinking, Mr. Yulston, sir, yes. And he says, I, I, but would, would you be interested in a trade? Well, yes. <laughs> and so very early on, just as probably just to validate my efforts, perhaps he'd offered to trade me one of his little work prints for, for one of mine. And it, believe me, it made my year and just kept me on track with thinking I was on the right track. Uh, sometime, this is in the mid seventies, this is visiting Jerry in his home. And what I have here, this next little string of pictures are really just sort of what it's like around Jerry's house and his studio. And really, I think there are a few people who you cannot separate their life from their work. Uh, and as unlikely as it seems, Jerry would be one of those people, unlikely in the sense that his, his photographs are unworldly or extra-worldly, and yet the world he builds around himself in his own way is just sort of a natural extension of this. It looks like the, some, something between the, the basement storeroom of the Smithsonian and King Tut's tomb in, in his <laughs> studio. Uh, the front part of his house is quite orderly and, and wonderful. This is his bookcase off on the side of the living room. But when you get back toward the studio, you are walking into, well, what we'd loosely call an alternate reality, I guess. Uh, so all I could do were make panos because any one photograph, you just get this little glimpse of the reality. But if you stand back and do a panorama of his outer darkroom studio, this is it. This isn't prepared for the occasion. This is what he lives with 24 seven. He collects everything, uh, everything in the world. One could do a, do a whole uh, catalog of that outer space where he does. Uh, this is the uh, middle space as it were. This is what you'd call the outer dark room. When you walk out of your dark room and you need a countertop to put things on and look at them. This is the outer part of Jerry's dark room. And these are hordes of proof sheets. They're not arranged for the occasion. This is just his house. I was there for a week or so at one point and th th this is just the way it is. And the tables are filled with proof sheets that date randomly back decades that he pulls out for the occasion. And the way that Jerry works at assembling the cosmology that you see when you look at one of his photographs is to take these proof sheets. And if you can see what he's doing here, he's folding over one proof sheet and laying it against another proof sheet. And this gives him a sort of a thumbnail idea of what direction to take, what, what, what of, which one of 50,000 negatives to pull out of the drawers and put into the enlarger. And as, uh, as, as Brian was saying, what he does is he has a whole series of enlargers. I got a picture here in a minute. I think this next one though is, uh, uh, well, well, we'll circle back on that one. But this is another photograph of the dark room, same as, as, as uh, Brian, Brian was showing you. And he has, in this case, seven matched enlargers standing up again above matched easels and matched negative carriers and matched burning and dodging tools. And rather than changing negatives when he's printing from three or four negatives, he will simply put a different negative in each of the enlargers. He has to pre-focus each one 
and get the correct exposure for each one separately on various test prints. And then when he's ready and everything is pre-aligned, he, he takes a sheet of paper, puts it under the first enlarger, gives it you know 12 seconds at F8 and all the burning and dodging, moves it down, puts it under the second larger. But think about this. We can see that finished print and there's the tree in the sky and the, and the seed pod down in the water and the ripple coming out of the water and the angel in the corner and a cloud drifting in over something. When you're standing there in the dark room, you're looking at a blank sheet of paper. He has to go down and position each of these to the correct relative spot, sometimes projecting them down and doing drawings on blank sheets of paper until each one is in the correct position. And then when the time comes, he puts him in the enlarger and, and goes down the road with them. And uh, I was there with him one morning and, and he got a phone call and he said, oh golly, I'm sorry, Ted, listen to this, this gallery, just they have to get this print and I have to print it today. And rather than going out to visit the alligators, whatever, could you come in and help me make a, make a print? Um, and so he went in there and got it all set up. And then I went in and I was doing processing while he did the printing. But here's the thing. In the course of a morning, he printed about 25 finished copies of a picture which had to go through six enlargers each time he made a single print. The man is just phenomenally organized when he sits down and does this work. No matter how free floating it, it looks, the amount of technical energy that gets thrown into it is uh, ab absolutely amazing. And so here he is in the dark room with one of those things. And I'll just mention in, in, in this, this last picture I have, that this is Jerry, the last time I saw him, which was just before, the, just before COVID came in, actually it was uh, just around Christmas time of the year before. And um, Jerry had had a terrible stroke uh, about a year earlier, and he had to learn how to talk. He learned how to how to walk. He had to come back completely. And believe me, he is back at hundred and ten percent. And this is Jerry uh, out in one in the hallway in his house. And what he's showing me is a little art piece made by someone who I think Brian is going to introduce you to perhaps next week. Is that possible? Are you keeping it a secret or is it? Anyway, Lori Verba, one of my favorite photographer, <laughs> photographers uh, made this piece that he's got his hand up against. And uh, uh, he, is, he is one of, he is a collector of her work uh, as well as other people's. So, at any rate, that's a sort of a big, clumsy, lumpy overview of the man. But I, but I have to say that uh, he's really made a difference to me in the work that I do, and he's one of a, a very select group of people I would, I would count as a, a real, a real genuine patron of the art at all levels. So there you go, Brian. There's the little, the little, the little overview, and I'll, I'll back out of this and <laughs> give you back the screen. Thanks a million. Only you could have given those insights, that's for sure. That was one big homage to somebody who preceded and really kind of predicted digital imaging. But uh, here's a topic that Ted knows uh, more about than the rest of us. But when you talk about Jerry, when you talk about creativity, he's not alone. He, he was not alone in that house of his. Uh, of course, this is a whole other chapter. But there was Jerry Olsman you know, world famous uh, analog darkroom magician. And then he married Maggie Taylor, who became, in my opinion, one of the pioneers of digital imaging, of digital art. And it was so fitting that uh, these lucky curators across the country would uh, have a, a two person show with husband and wife. Um, here is Maggie Taylor and you can see uh, her husband behind her. Uh, and as some of you know, and if you read the gossip columns, they're not actually married anymore. Um, but uh, I, when they were married, I, I had always wished that I could be some kind of spirit catcher. I, I wish I could have created a net above their double bed in their bedroom because the dreams coming up out of either the left or the right hand side of that bed must have been unbelievable. Here's Maggie Taylor showing, you know, she 
as I've said, became world famous and still is for digital imaging. But what she's showing us is how, how low tech she is. She hardly even takes any digital pictures. Um, and here's just a refresher on Maggie Taylor. She was born in 1961. She uh, is a learned woman, got her BA degree in philosophy from Yale in 1983, got her MFA from uh, the University of Florida in 1987. And Ted, was she actually one of Jerry's models? I believe uh, she was actually perhaps his babysitter. Uh huh. All right, I will. Uh, I will uh, <laughs> turn <laughs> a major source of second wives in, over the years. It seems. I love how you speak in PG-rated terms. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just look at this. This is just mind blowing. And again, even now, this looks fresh and and you know state of the art. But she did this probably fifteen years ago. Uh, just these impossible scenes. So here's here's the Maggie Taylor color version of sort of what was rattling around in Yulesman in her husband's mind. Not that either of them, you know, uh, borrowed unfairly from one another. I mean, these are completely different artworks than than Yulesman. And you can see how she went her own way technologically. Ted showed us Jerry's uh, darkroom. Well, this is all electricity going on in Maggie's studio. I, I went out photographing with, with, with Maggie one day and it did not require a camera. She didn't bring a camera. We drove down the road and there's a string of antique stores uh, in Gainesville and they've all learned to save early ambrotypes and daguerreotypes for, for Maggie to look at. And she looks through them and finds all those interesting heads and figures and strange backgrounds. They're all straight out of the antique stores downtown. That is incredible. And Ted, look, as you well know, this, I, I, as you all know, I don't use the word masterpiece too often, but I would say this is one of Maggie Taylor's masterpieces. Uh, and as Ted mentioned, this all began in an anonymous, antiquated image of some young girl. Uh, and then, of course, Maggie Taylor combined that with, you know, uh, dozens of pictures of bees, you know, painstakingly. Uh, cut and pasted digitally, electronically, to create this um, unbelievable trademark image of Maggie Taylor. So all I can do today, my friends, is just show you just some brief glimpses of some amazing artists working today. And as usual, we hardly scratch the surface each, each time we meet. But you You'll see their names, you know, printed in each of my slides. And uh, so if you fall in love with one of these artists, there are monographs and, you know, websites on, on each of these people. So there was first God created Maggie Taylor, uh, and she's still alive and super creative. And then, then on the second day, you know, uh, many, 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 many photographers learned Photoshop and uh, carried on that tradition of creating surreal worlds in Photoshop. Tom Chambers is one of the reigning champions of this, uh, making, you know, what appears to be seamless imagery, but impossible once you think about it. I showed you, I'm showing you the titles of each of these as well. This I think is pretty fantastic. Uh, And for any of you who have raised two wild sons, I can relate to this, that's for sure. Uh, pretty darn good. You know, uh, if you look super closely, you know, you'll see edges, uh, but I think that doesn't bother Tom Chambers. And he, he wins all kinds of awards for illustration. Uh, beautiful work, again, kind of carrying on in in that tradition of, of combining multiple, multiple images that of course Jerry began in the darkroom years ago. Um, I thought I was exaggerating when I said Jerry has been, been doing this for 50 years, but that only would put him back at 1970 and he was working the darkroom a good 10 or 15 years prior to that. Beautiful stuff by Tom Chambers. Now we're gonna change pace. Look at what this invention has done to the world. You know, this is rapidly becoming the most popular 
camera in the world, much to the dismay of Nikon and Canon uh, and Leica, who had the market cornered prior to this little upstart. But if you look at graphs of camera sales, uh, they just fell off a cliff around 2010, 2015. And uh, I frankly, I mean, it's very safe to say that point and shoot cameras are deader than a doornail right now. The little cameras that you and I used to take on our vacations. I think the only camera currently that has a chance of survival, and I wouldn't bet on it, uh, are, you know, full frame, you know, the Sonys that you all have uh, for your travel pictures nowadays or your full frame Canons or Nikons, those cameras can do things, these little, uh, that these iPhones can't, but each each new iteration, you know, now we're on the iPhone 12, which is, which shoots everything in HDR, you know, every picture it takes is HDR. I know I'm getting technical here, but HDR is still kind of a, a fancy thing for a Sony full frame or Nikon, but these iPhones, are doing, uh, this is called computational imaging. And I think it was estimated, I think Apple brags that, that these phones are making a trillion computations a second, uh, which, you know, we are unaware of, but um, of course the advent of <laughs> phones uh, does cause certain problems for us educators like Ted and I. <laughs> This is such a great image, you know, in the Rijks Museum. You're supposed to be looking at that Rembrandt. Uh, um, the backstory, though, I think, in, in order to save the face of these young people looking at their phones and not at the original, you know, $200 million masterpiece behind them, the backstory I've been told is that this was a class outing and the teacher told them to look up, you know, information about Rembrandt. Uh, so that's what they're doing. So I'll, I'll give these kids a break, but this is our lives, Ted and I standing in front of these young people, kids these days. But, you know, speaking of iPhones, you, you cannot talk about iPhone photography about then without talking about the man, Ted's friend and mine, uh, the man, Dirk, Dan Burkholder, who I give a world of credit to. Um, he was one of the first fine art photographers to champion digital technology. He has helped us out. He really has helped the rest of us uh, iPhone photographers immensely. He started out as a platinum printer and way back in the early 1990s, that's just the birth of digital imaging. He developed a way to take digital pictures, bring them into Photoshop, allowing us to remove the telephone poles um, and to move pixels around, move our pixels that are a tortoise and move those pixels into a church interior in Texas. I can remember seeing this and I was just blown away at, at how seamless this was. I mean, this was the early 1990s. I mean, we were, ama we, we were amazed that you could actually cast a fake shadow under a fake tortoise and just... <laughs> Yeah, everything. It really was an out-of-body experience in the very early, early moments there. Good, good eye, Ted. That shadow just seals the deal. It just makes it so convincing that this tortoise is flying. So this is the early 1990s, and I, I would brag about Dan in two realms. Uh, in one realm, he, he uh, showed us how to, instead of make a print, of your image out of Photoshop, you could make a negative. You could put a sheet of clear film, not photographic film, but basically a sheet of acetate in your printer, in your Epson printer, and you could print out a negative of this image that you'd manipulated in, in Photoshop. And now you have this in a big negative. Now you can make platinum prints, you could make cyanotypes, you could make gum bicomate prints. So you just opened this digital world to uh, traditional 19th century printers. And the, the next thing he did is he, he was the guy and is still doing it, who uh, taught us how to make the most of our iPhones, uh, whether they're Apple brands or, or other brands, Googles or uh, Androids. So this is still the best book 
out there on uh, making art with your phone cameras. And just to prove it, uh, Dan Burkholder has made all these images with a phone and he even manipulated them in his phone. Personally, I'd much rather look at a larger screen when I'm fiddling around digitally, but he loves getting on a train here in New York, taking a picture, a very, very, very banal picture, uh, leaving the station. Uh, and he and his wife live in upstate New York, up in the Catskills. And as he's chugging along on the train, heading home, uh, might take an hour or two, he'll be uh, sitting on his train seat uh, and he'll be fiddling on his phone. And by the time he steps off the train, he'll have completed uh, one of these really amazing textural images. I'll just take, give you a quick glimpse of uh, Dan Burkholder's stunning work. I, I have to say masterpiece again. I mean, this, this just totally blows my mind. I'd like to put in a, a sort of a plug for, for Dan to, to say that uh, among workshops teachers in his little specialized area of iPhone, he is a master uh, workshop instructor. I had a one day workshop with him in how to use the iPhone and, and it was, it amazed me and I'm not easily amazed at how much I learned in terms of hardcore data and how to manipulate the apps and all of the apps that are available and so on and so forth. So if you really want to get a, a, a good good handle on that business at, at some point and you see his name pop up with a workshop at the Center for Photographic Art or somewhere, um, give, it, give it some thought. It's, he's a good person to learn from. You are so right, Ted. He is such a showman. He gets my vote for one of the most polished performers for, for workshops. I mean, he has got it down. Uh, anyway, take a look at, uh, you know, now that you know he lives in the Catskills with all those fall and foliage colors, these are so, they're just delicious, delicious images, all made in an iPhone. I mean, this is enough to make me put my Sony full frame, you know, on Craigslist, uh, alas. Of course, he's using a lot of a lot of voodoo magic going on here. Texture screens in the sky, you know, all kinds of color manipulations. So this is not low tech at all, even though he's got it all uh, placed on his iPhone. I actually took a workshop from him online the other day through the LA Center for Phot Photography, and he he he's such a a jokester, but I think he wasn't kidding. He said he once had 900 apps on his phone. So he had to go to Apps Anonymous to uh, to to dry out, you know, to sober up from all that. And I think he wasn't kidding. I mean, he's just so facile with technology. Anyway, switching gears here, so much to see. You know, when we talk about digital imaging and, we, and, and the umbrella that that's under is, you know, electronic imaging, if you bring electricity into this, uh, you gotta, you have to acknowledge the fact that photography now has expanded. It has more opportunities. We have more opportunities to have our work seen, which is all to the good. But you know, this topic today has to give a nod to these new forums, uh, these new venues for imaging. For example, Instagram, and many of you are up to speed on your Bernie Sanders uh, viral <laughs> appearances that he's been making with those mittens. Um, there's actually a program, many, many of you probably have it, a program that's gone viral that allows you to just put Bernie in your living room or in your front yard. Um, but I'm only showing you this, not because of Bernie, but because of you know one of the new uh, world-changing platforms for photographers is Instagram. You know, many, many, many thousands and thousands of photographers regard Instagram as their showcase. And that is true. Um, I'm still kind of a Luddite and I'm not up to speed on Instagram, but I should be. But I'm sure most of you uh, listening uh, have a wonderful Instagram account. You know, YouTube, is out there uh, spreading the word. 
And of course, Facebook, you know, we all post images on Facebook. This is just kind of a generic uh, homepage for Facebook. But let's talk about this just for a minute. I'm open if any of you want to hit touch the space bar and hold it down. You can unmute yourselves very easily. What's the difference? And I won't take more than two minutes on this, but I want to let any of you get a word in edgewise. What's the difference between looking at a picture of this guy holding a pie on a monitor, you know, rear illuminated, uh, versus looking at a picture of this guy holding a pie printed on a piece of paper, beautifully printed, beautifully matted, beautifully framed, physically in front of you in a bricks and mortar gallery. Like my favorite one, Center for Photographic Art. You know, many of you have gone there and stood in front of those hallowed walls that Ansel Adams painted uh, initially. Um, what's the difference between viewing an image online and versus physically in a bricks and mortar gallery? I know I'm tossing out an impossible question to answer. Let's give an example. Watch this. I'm going to take one of the billion or more images that are uploaded each day to Facebook. Let's take a look at this posting. A post after the fires swept through the central coast. And I guess most of you are from this general area. I'm going to switch to a better view of your beautiful, beautiful. I'm going to go with masterpiece again here. Uh, uh, this is a screenshot I took from Facebook. Um, and I, well, I'm going to ask Ted to read his, his post. You can see Ted has six or seven people who kind of like his work, you know, and uh, um, take a look at just the numbers here. You know, I, I tossed out an impossible question to all of you a minute ago about like, what's the difference between seeing Ted's picture on your monitors as you are at this moment versus having gone to CPA and seen it beautifully, a big 16 by 20 print framed on the wall. Well, you know, one difference in these in those two kind of venues is that 373 people uh, can see it just just in the, on that, you know, now that's probably a couple thousand. Um, but, you know, over 300 people saw it, 89 people talked about it, almost 200 people passed it on to someone else. You know, that ain't going to happen in, in an art gallery. So there are incredible benefits to showing your work online. That's an understatement. People can view your work. Some of these people probably live in other countries or other states who could have never come to uh, a gallery in Carmel to see it. Huge benefits to this new world of online galleries. Any drawbacks? One drawback is uh, when I go like, the next time I uh, click a picture, it's gone. You know, they're good. Ted's beautiful work is gone. You know, it was ephemeral. Whereas if we went to the gallery, you know, and, and purchased it or took it home, uh, if we looked away, we could look back and it would still be there. So these online venues are very fleeting. They're temporal, but they do have fantastic advantages in terms of letting people see your work. Any, any thoughts on any of that from anybody? Ryan, I this is Jocelyn. I have I have a couple of thoughts. Oh, Jocelyn, I'm ready for your brilliance. <laughs> I uh, I think about this question a lot, of course, and um, one of the things is that it's it's really clear that there's a difference between looking at a picture made by light and a picture made by pigment, Beautiful. so that like that picture that was in Grand Central Station so many years ago. You know, I think it was by Kodak, and it and it was lit from behind, and it was so beautiful, uncompare, incomparable to any billboard, no matter how strong the pigments were. Another difference that I'm thinking about is the fact that um, it depends on the viewer's monitor. Whatever I share with my friends that I've taken, no matter what it looks like. It's completely dependent on what my friend is viewing it on. So it could be a badly calibrated monitor or a cheap monitor. The other thing is size of your monitor. If you're looking on an iPhone at an Instagram picture, it's going to be a lot different perception, including the kind of clarity that you get when things are reduced. It's a different perception than when I come home and I look 
on one of my larger monitors. Those are just some of the thoughts I was. Dear Jocelyn, it's such a joy to have you with us. And I, oh, thanks. Uh, whatever you are thinking, it's worth the rest of us hearing, that's for sure. Great observations. Scale, you know, uh, Ted has a favorite size that he would print this. Um, he's at our mercy if we're viewing it on our iPhone. You know, in broad sunlight, we're just murdering all his hard earned, you know, artwork. Uh, rear illumination versus pigment. You're absolutely right. The one you just had up there, not the one with the words here, but the one that was just there that filled the screen, sure. that, that, that view of the, uh, of the sunflower. Yes, that one. Uh, that's on my screen, on my iMac. That's, that's roughly the size that my print is, size-wise. And I look at this on the screen, and um, it, it doesn't hold a candle to a physical print. And there, one can get into sort of semantic black holes here trying to describe the physicality or something or the sense of the artist's hand having actually touched the piece of paper that you're holding in your hand. But I will say also, just looking at this picture compared to a print the same size, uh, if I wanted to see how much detail was in this picture that's on the screen, I'd have to enlarge the screen and then look in and see, oh yes, the, the edge of the, the flower petals are, are sharp or they have a texture to them, or I can sense the ash that's sitting on them if I blow it up on the screen. But at this size, it doesn't look that way at all. It's a picture of sunflowers on a screen. Um, and so, but in the actual print, all of that detail is there all of the time. And you see much more detail at this size in a print than you see at this size on the screen. You're seeing the whole print all the time when you're looking at a real physical print. Whereas here, you'd have to sort of enlarge it and see whether the seeds in the sunflower are really visible or it's, it, the subtleties get lost is what it comes down to. The subtleties that you really work for in a print. Now that's presuming that you are working for a print. I would imagine that it's just a matter of time before you cross some threshold, if we haven't long since, where people's end product is the screen image, in which case they would be aiming for a different point than I'm aiming for when I make a physical print. It's just a different aiming point. And so find me some artist, anyone, uh, who only show their work on screen. Then you'd have a chance to look at what an artist thinks the greatest potential of screen image is and, and how you get there. I look, I'm, I'm looking here at a reproduction of my work. That's the thing that I snag on. And it never carries the import or the gravitas, if any, that the actual physical piece has. Well, it, be beautiful, Ted. I, I want to uh, credit the other side of your brain, uh, uh, and that is your, your internationally uh, renowned author with your incredible art and fear, you and David Bales. Read us, read us the post you put on Facebook, which I think is 50% of the success of this image. I mean, it's, your writing is, is brilliant, just as this image is. Wait, wait till you hear his words. You'll see this in a different light, this, this still life. Go ahead, Ted. A few days ago, I drove up Coast Highway following the route I'd taken a week earlier when I just happened to be up there and the smoke was bursting out on the hillsides, but it was just smoke and it was way off there. And we came home and, and uh, didn't find out till the next day what was really happening. But it says here, uh, one particular scene I happened upon, however, seemed particularly sad. I think poignant would have been the better word an entire field of giant sunflowers that had somehow escaped the flames themselves only to succumb to the accompanying heat and falling ash. Personally, I sense an almost human pathos in the gesture of that plant, like a mother holding her dying children in her arms. We worry about whether the fires will touch us, but imagine how the landscape feels. I anthropomorphize everything, I can tell you that in a flash, and I, I saw this sunflower, one of a bunch of them that were growing in this field. And I'm looking up, I'm standing up, looking up at this sunflower. It is that big, it's, it's 
it's eight feet above the ground, the, 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 the big sunflower there. And all of the other ones that are attached on the different branches have all sort of drooped off. And it just had that feeling that, uh, you know, that like, like you wanted to make friends with this poor sunflower that was just holding her dying children in her arms that had all been killed by the heat and the ash falling on them. So I made that photograph and I wanted to get rid of all of the extraneous stuff, throw the background out of focus, which is a little harder than you think with a digital camera, it seems. And uh, I, it, this is a color photograph. I think I have overlaid a little bit of, of sepia toning onto the overall image. But if you look closely, you can see the yellow of the sunflower petals coming out at you and the green of the leaves and they're all covered with this ash that mutes all of that color ent entirely and I just wanted to enhance that feeling that this poor thing was just utterly battered down into submission. Incredible. I should add Ted lives in Santa Cruz and we're talking about you know those uh, forest fires we had the CZ S or whatever they are uh, uh, fires that were just a few miles north of Ted. Beautifully done, Ted O. You know, it's amazing. You know, some other class we should talk about the power of words. Uh, Ted's words were far more than a caption. I think it was really uh, an equal poem, equal to the image. But it's incredible how this scene changes after hearing his words. He says, you know, we worry about forest fires. Imagine how the landscape feels. Beautiful perspective. Switching gears. <laughs> Let's take a look at uh, Nick Brandt, and we're going to circle back to Ted. I'm going to hand it over to him in a few minutes. So Nick Brandt, many of you know him for his uh, still images. Um, he shoots with film and prints digitally, but this isn't really one I want to show you from his work. But this was the cover of his first book, and he's internationally renowned. You know, he was a... Uh, video director for Michael Jackson videos when Michael was alive. They went off to Africa together to shoot Michael Jackson music videos. And Nick Brandt became really involved in animal conservation. And so to this day, he has dedicated his work to trying to spread the word to, to preserve wildlife in Africa. So these are just breathtaking, breathtaking images by Nick Brandt. Uh, not really what I wanted to show you, but I mean, look at that, how powerful that transition is. Incredible, incredible, incredible. And of course, he founded uh, Big Life. You'll see this on the website, Nick Brandt, or you go to Big Life, and he he's trying to raise donations to, uh, to preserve these elephants. Um, I uh, had a chance to hear him speak about this picture. This is on a preserve, of course, in Africa. This is Craig. Nick says, Craig's dead. Poacher got him. So, I mean, it's an, it's unbelievable, you know, that you can have uh, images that Nick has made. And even, even in the few years since then, they've these animals have already been shot for their ivory. But this is what I really want to show you about Nick Brandt. If you go to his website uh, today, you'll see his latest work is on the front page and he's done different bodies of work but this one is called this empty world and again today we're gathered together to take a look at photographers who make use of the latest technology i don't want to take our time to read all this but he'll uh, this is on his website he says each image with, that i'm about to show you is a combination of two moments in time captured weeks apart almost from the exact same locked off camera position uh, he'll take one picture, leave the camera there basically in a blind, which I'll show you, uh, let things happen for a few weeks, come back, and then set up scenes using uh, African uh, citizens. Uh, so the final large scale prints are a composite of two images. So Nick Brandt is currently making impossible pictures like this. What's happening is He'll, he'll set up a camera in a blind, um, digital camera. He, he may put food out, of course, you know, none of these people will be here, but he'll put food out in front of the camera and attract a rhinoceros, take that picture. Then 
uh, come back days later assembling a cast of thousands, uh, so to speak, that he is setting up, you know, he is directing from his video directing days, uh, Africans uh, that he's paying to be here. They're all looking on their iPhones. But he'll, now the rhinoceros is long gone, but he did stand there. He was there. You know, here's a straight picture of a rhino on this ground. He's not cut and paste in. Days later, Nick will come back at night with this cast, have them line up, take a second picture, and then uh, he'll superimpose the two pictures to put there with the people. So this is what he's doing. You know, uh, at first he may put food on the ground uh, in this dirt pile. An elephant may come attracted to the dirt. He'll take that picture. Then the elephant goes away. Then days later, he'll actually construct. I mean, Nick comes in with some serious firepower. He must have made a lot of money as a video director. I kid you not, millions. Because he'll come in, he will build uh, a gas station. It might not have fuel in it, but he will build a gas station set in back of where this elephant stood. Then he'll take a second picture and combine the elephant and the gas station. Here's a, a view of his camera in an animal rhino proof block box, uh, which sets down on the ground and it stays there. So here's, here's what an elephant would see when he's coming up to drink from a pond and, and uh, you know, remotely, Nick will be taking pictures of the animals. And of course, in front of the camera, there will be something that attracts the animals. So you'd be able to get scenes where an elephant came to drink from a pond. And then after the elephant's gone, Nick will embellish the scene with actors. He'll pour oil in a pond. You know, the elephant, Nick, Nick loves animals. He'd never have an elephant drink from some oil waste pond. But when the elephant has been photographed and he's gone, then Nick will create this kind of evil looking uh, pond that the elephant appears to be drinking from. Very powerful stuff brought to you, you know, by what we're exploring today, people making use of technology to make uh, very creative art. Uh, take a look at how this freeway overpass was actually built by Nick's, he calls it the art crew. I mean, holy cow in order to have a scene that looks like there are construction workers with wild elephants wandering through. And of course, you, you get the message here that animals are rapidly losing their land to civilization. And so in his mind, the day may come when, when wild animals have no wild place to live and they may be wandering through civilization. sometimes using that set for, for different scenes. So pretty incredible stuff really brought to you by modern technology. In this case, not Photoshopping, not cutting and pasting that we saw Tom Chambers doing or Maggie Taylor, you know, cutting and pasting, collaging pictures. These are really, in a way, these are double exposures. The, you know, the rhino really stood on that ground and the tires were really behind where he stood. It's just that he wasn't there when the tires were there. Okay, I want to come down the home stretch. Since we're talking about critters and technology, we're going to keep sizing down here. We, we looked at elephant scale, uh, state-of-the-art technology. Kate Brakey is one of my favorite contemporary photographers. She gets my award for most prolific uh, artist. She came on the scene by hand painting, oil painting. These are just regular artists oil paintings, nothing special, nothing, these aren't photo oils. Uh, and she'll take a picture, in this case of a, a dead bird on the ground, black and white picture, and she'll add brown to the leaves with sepia oil paint or burnt umber, and she'll add color to the bird with, with uh, a lizard crimson and other oil paints. But that's not what I wanted to show you because that was very, very analog. That was taking photos and then applying color by hand, which is really low tech. What I, one of the things I love about her, many different bodies of work, she's using a trail cam, you know, which is high tech. 
Now we're, we're in the world of digital cameras being triggered, motion sensored cameras and infrared light beaming off of the trail cam, which animals don't see. I love her trail cam work. And I actually think these are elevated to the level of art. Uh, she lives in Tucson and uh, man, I'm not sure I'd leave her backyard at night. Uh, she says that she puts a trail cam just outside her backyard in the desert. She lives sort of out in the country, outside of Tucson uh, in Southern Arizona. And this is what's going on out outside her backyard. These beautiful Havelina, Havelina mom and her kids. I'm sure Kate is throwing a McDonald's hamburger over the fence or something. I mean, this is just I live out in Carmel Valley and I have put out a trail cam and I, I hardly get anything other than a rabbit. Uh, but here's a pack rat and a beautiful little fox. And in her exhibitions, these would be uh, almost three feet wide. I mean, they're animal size, they're life size. Uh, and I think these are really a fun example of using technology uh, to make work that's beyond technology. Daniel Carrico does incredible things. Uh, you can see he's a professor at East Carolina University. He came out with a book, Aliens Among Us. After you view his pictures, my friends, you may think twice before you step on a moth. Uh, look how beautiful this weevil is. You gotta be kidding me. Decked out in, in fancy clothes. Look at this collar on this weevil. Of course, these are electron microscopic images of these creepy things that live in our house. But I, and we've all seen, you know, macro, micro photos of bugs, but um, Daniel, you know, goes to great pains to make, to give these, uh, um, these little critters these beautiful formal portraits, which almost look like paintings. And it, it just shows us how impossibly magnificent these little constructions are from nature. I mean, a webworm moth looks like this if we could only get close enough. And I'm not sure we want to. I think, I wonder if he hand colors those because my, my sense is that an electron microscope would be hitting them with wavelengths of light that would not record colors with any fidelity, would, wouldn't record colors, period. Speaking of hand coloring, look at this. I'll, I don't want to take much time. We'll just take maybe 30 seconds. So he snatches a little bug. We're talking technology here. But look, Ted is right. He's going to begin selectively coloring. Of course, that would also apply to Hubble telescope pictures when the colors sometimes change. I won't show much more of this, but uh, this is where he'll selectively color, as Ted said. This guy knows more about Photoshop than I do, I'll tell you that. So this is just one bug. You can see this on Daniel Carrico's website. Right you are, Ted. So every time you walk across your carpet, remember this guy's looking up at you, or two love-struck weevils. I think you'd have to be a weevil to be into this. An owlet moth, you've got to be kidding me. Look at this strange mole cricket. I'm going to come down the home stretch here. No talk about modern technology would be complete without a nod to drones. And one person among us is really into drone photography and he has taken some wonderful images uh, at 
Pebble Beach. Joel, he's, he gets himself in trouble by winging his uh, drones off of his front porch during the US Open last year, but he comes up with these beautiful, beautiful images. Thank you, Joel. Hi, Brian. Hello, Dr. Joel. It's thoroughly enjoying this show today. <laughs> Wonderful. Sorry for me to put you under the spotlight. I'm just going to keep bragging about you. Uh, <laughs> Just, I want to, we should let them know, Joel, that drone photography is not all roses. Uh, here, here is the maestro himself. Everything's going great. We're at a friend's house out in the valley. Joel has taken his drone up. Everything's going great. He's leading the good life. He's viewing, he's viewing the camera's eye view on his drone on a screen. Everything's going great. And then a hawk comes in and practically snatches his drones so like whoa <laughs> i love this well this okay life is good like whoa wait what happened to the drone <laughs> you're very photogenic there right you you my friend I, you look good with that worried look on your face now joel i'm not saying you've been around a long time but i have to show them your early work when <laughs> joel was a little younger you know it didn't just start with electronics he he did figure a way to attach cameras to birds. Uh, and uh, this is one of Joel's early drones. <laughs> this is low, very low tech. <laughs> and one of Joel's early landscapes from a, a pigeon's eye view. Um, and as Joel loves to remind us, this is words to live by. You tell us, Joel. Oh, this is, this is it. And every Every person who wants to fly a drone should put this under their pillow <laughs> three nights. And so it's, it, so it's uh, injected into their subconscious. Uh, they have to know about this. There are old pilots and there are bull pilots, but there are no old bull pilots. <laughs> Bravo. Well, thank you, my buddy, for letting us look at your beautiful drone images um, to represent that whole new genre of photography made possible by little tiny cameras in in uh, uh, with video remote control it is so much fun and this uh, drone that i'm using now has a hasselblad camera on it unbelievable yeah. unbelievable we're gonna we'll have to see more of yours but now i'm going to i'm gonna step aside and give the wheel to uh the beloved ted orlin I was going to brag about you, Ted. Maybe I'll just say, I want to show pictures because I might have stepped on your toes with some of the pictures I had queued up. Uh, but I will quote your dear friend, the co-author of Art and Fear, who once introduced you at a show of yours. And he said, Ted Orlin has really only had two bosses. His first boss, after Ted graduated from USC, uh, his first boss was Charles and Ray Eames, uh, aims of the of the you know world-renowned design studio those were his first bosses Charles and Ray Eames and his second boss I forget who his second boss was yeah he was, lives off on the peninsula somewhere <laughs> all right take it over my friend I'm going to stop sharing okay uh, now the fun starts everyone thank you I'm going to share my screen here if I get a chance well let me let me just stop for 10 seconds and and I'm I'm loving this. My, I'm practically paralyzed by all the new ideas you're dumping into my lap at this point, and whatever I had to say is going to become completely unintelligible. But the way Brian laid this class out in, in terms of the way he's surveying the field, looking at photographers who have stayed with analog, photographers who've jumped to the far end and gone over to the dark side and are working entirely in digital, and then a third category, I guess, perhaps next week, it'll deal more with, with people that are working with alternative processes or busy rediscovering early processes that have gotten lost over the course of time. And, you know, the question that brings to mind, mind partly is why do people change using, change the tools they're using? Uh, and do you have a choice in the matter? Or are you just getting dragged along by technology? Uh, the I've been in photography long enough that I started out uh, 
when there was only analog photography. You didn't even theorize about digital photography. And now there are people coming into the game who uh, you'd have to explain what an analog photograph is. But basically, let me start with just a premise, a basic premise or two. Uh, one is that photography, among the visual arts, photography, especially in the pre-digital age, was like the most experiential of art forms. Basically, to get a picture of something, you had to be there. That's no longer the case. And the question is, well, it, it raises all, all sorts of questions. But um, what, what intrigues me is there are people who stay with the tools they started with, and there are people who migrate onto the new tools as they come along. And I tend to be very much in the latter category, but I was immersed for the longest time in an analog world. So what I have here is sort of partly Pilgrim's Progress, but I don't really want to show you my work so much as talk about how the work happened, how the work unfolds and how we all develop as artists over, over time. Brian mentioned my, my first, uh, first employer was Charles Eames of Eames Chairs, Eames Office. I was a graphic designer, and exhibit designer at the time. And this is me as a young Cuban revolutionary many, many <laughs> decades ago. And um, I, I just want to slide through these uh, quickly and say that uh, basically the Eames office is where I actually learned something about photography. I came into it with a hand camera and I maybe had developed a film, roll of film once. And Eames liked to hire people that were bright uh, and throw them into job, some job they'd never done before. So I came in as a graphic designer, and this is what I did a lot of the time, doing uh, uh, filmmaking and, and storyboards and so on and stuff like that. But he put me into the dark room, and basically I learned how to develop film and make decent prints working for Charles Eames. And then after I'd been there for a few years, I saw this little ad in the back of Pop Photo Magazine that Ansel Adams, whom I beg, whose name I vaguely recognized, was giving a workshop in Yosemite, which I'd never been to. And it was two weeks for $150 with, with uh, Ansel. And I thought, well, that's a lot of money, but I do have a summer vacation coming up. It seemed harmless enough and basically changed my life. And uh, we can go into this at some depth someday in another, in another world. But the main thing is uh, uh, what I picked up from Ansel was I picked up mostly from by osmosis. I picked up gobs of technical knowledge, which eventually I had to unlearn as the technology changed. Uh, but I also just picked up a, a sense for someone who really knows what he's doing and has arranged his life in a manner that allows him to get his work done over and over again uh, as time passes. And I was able to work at, at Ansel's house uh, and so some of this is just sort of background material and I'll try not to dwell on it at length. This is Ansel's sorting through prints in his house. And one of my jobs was to burn any of the prints that had crinkles in them in his giant fireplace. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine me as the, sort of this, uh, I describe myself sometimes a scared young rabbit coming in and working for God. And the first job he gives me the first day I walk in the door is to go through boxes of old prints look for those that have crinkles or scratches in them and feed them to the fireplace. <laughs> and that's what's going on, on here. And then in the course of time, eventually I, uh, uh, I was basically a gopher. You like, I did everything that, to, that would get things out of his hair. And, uh, but I did print the special edition prints, the eight by 10 prints uh, that he sells up in Yosemite and thousands and thousands of those. And in some faint, harbinger of the future, unbeknownst at the time. When you print a hundred moon and half domes or let's say mirror lake pictures one after another, you just go crazy because the burning and dodging is the same for each one for hours and hours and hours. So every 50th print I'd make, I'd give myself a little perk. And so this is one from, I was printing his picture of uh, Mirror Lake, which is this wonderful, sharp focus, large format, ultimate tonal range, wonderful classic photograph of Mirror Lake. But every now and then I would pause and make one that was a little bit 
different. <laughs> and uh, your quiz at the end of this will be to point out what is, but in any event, um, uh, the, this was life, life there was at this house was wonderful. And I also picked up a great deal of, of photographic history while I was working there. This is Beaumont Newhall in the center of the picture, uh, who literally wrote the first book on the history of photography. And I'm not saying this to name drop, I'm saying this partly to show that photography is such a young art that you really can with two degrees of separation, find yourself back at the very beginnings of when photography was even recognized as an art form. So this is Beaumont Newhall and Morley Bear, if anybody here remembers Morley from Living on the Coast, and Virginia Adams, who had a wonderful collection of stereo cards and early 19th century photographs of Yosemite. And she got me interested in sort of the breadth of photography, got me out of my tunnel vision of simply looking at the next tree I'm facing and looking at the larger world in a historical time-related context. So what I, the point, basic point I wanted to make in, in the name dropping, if you will, is that I credit a lot of what I've accomplished or what I've decided to take on in the arts as the result of having met some truly remarkable people. And uh, Morley, and uh, this was back in the days when photography, you could be the most famous photographer in the world and that plus a dime would get you a cup of coffee. They were just out there roaming the landscape with their giant, giant cameras. This is Brett Weston at, uh, at uh, Weston Beach, Al Weber and Cole Weston and Edna Bullock, who many of you might, might have met over time. But so this was Ansel's world. And the great thing about great people is they have great friends. It's sort of birds of a feather flock together. And uh, as I look at, again, trying to trace my progression, the ideas that I absorbed informally from people who really knew what they were doing just gives you faith that if you could focus your mind and your life well enough, you could get down onto that same path. And as I say, I met Ansel by taking his workshop. And uh, this is what workshops were like. This is 1973, I believe. And uh, these were uh, Ansel's helpers. Ansel's workshop when I was there, uh, you might recognize Alan Ross over on the very far left. But the point that I'd like to make here about this picture is mainly, we are talking about an absolute 100% analog world where view cameras roamed the landscape like Tyrannosauruses. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm coming into it with people that have been making pictures using cameras in a very similar manner for a hundred years, not, you know, since it was invented, that if you were to ask any photographer of that period, if you were to take all of the steps involved in making photographs and were to say, if you had to parcel out some of the work to be done, like there's developing the film, there's spotting the print, there's mounting the print, there's driving the car to get to the destination or whatever. What is the one element of photography that is right at the core of the creative process? What would you not give up to anybody else to do? And the answer is no one would let anybody else click the shutter. As I say, it was entirely experiential. You had an experience and at the right moment, you captured that experience. Uh, that's different now, but it was a long road getting there. But it, uh, at least coming into it, I not only met people who had mastered that traditional approach to photography, but those who were coming into the, to the art at that moment and were much more subject to the changes in technology that were coming down the line. There's an old Zen saying something to the effect that for the beginner, there are many paths for the advanced few. When you've reached a certain point, perhaps in your art making, you reach a point of stability where you have found the discoveries you are going to make and you begin working out the details from there. Ansel discovered large format, sharp focus photography early on, say the 1920s. And for the next 60 years, he stayed exactly on that track. 
And uh, so, well, uh, I'll get ahead of myself here, but I want to keep going. So it's just to say, I met all of these, I met people of my generations. And the wonderful thing about workshops is not simply what happens during the morning session or the afternoon session. The real stuff happens around the edges over lunch or dinner or late in the evening as you're sitting in people's uh, little lodge rooms looking at the test photographs you'd made the day those days. And so at the same time that I was learning from the gods of photography, as you were, Ansel et al., uh, I was meeting people of my generation and we'd sit down there in the, in the little lodge room. This is at the 19, this is a workshop in 1974, I believe. And so these were my fellow travelers at that point in time. This is us sitting, sitting in the lodge room in, at that workshop. Uh, Chris Johnson, my, myself, Bob Langham, uh, David Bales over on the far right and a little pixie down in the, in the front there is uh, someone, I don't know whatever happened to her, but uh, I think she survived <laughs> in the field some way or another. At any rate, they were my friends. I was a little bit older than them by a few years. And so they all looked up to me and gave me a lot of, lot of credit and you know, paid a lot of attention to everything that I said. They were, they were very good about that. But, but getting back to the point that this was an analog, pre-digital, pre-internet, world, pre-computer, pre-desktop computer world by 25 years, 20 anyway. Uh, when we left and went to our separate realms, David went back to Oregon, Sally went to Virginia, Bob Langham went to Texas, you know, I went back to Carmel, um, Chris Johnson was up in San Francisco. We would, the only way we could keep in touch was by writing what were then called letters, which you put in the mail and put envelope a sticker on them and send them off. Weird. And so we would exchange letters and test prints. And finally, what we decided the best thing we could do would be we would just form a little group, which we called ourselves the image continuum. And we would circulate a little, we would circulate our ideas back and forth between each other. And, and so we created a series of journals. It was an erratical rather than a periodical, I guess you'd say. In those days, without the internet, without uh, snapshot or whatever those things, Facebook and everything, we would put out these little journals. We'd print a hundred copies of this little magazine. It was a collation of our writings and our discussions with each other. And we would, uh, uh, then there were like about 10 of us in the group and we'd give everybody 10 copies, then they'd pass them out to their friends. And this was way, our way of keeping in touch. And the reason we printed a hundred, and this gets us back to technology again, is that um, we couldn't, there was no budget, period, zero. And you can't publish a magazine <clears throat> very easily that way, especially since reproductions cost a great deal. So all of the images in each edition were original silver prints that were tipped in to the edition. And the cover of the magazine, this is a contact print of Sally's self-portrait of herself in the, in the bathroom mirror. And we settled on a hundred copies because we figured we had a stamina enough to make a hundred copies of each of picture. And then we tip them into each copy and it went from there. And there's a physical thing that I would take over an ephemeral image I'd have to look up in a file somewhere on the screen to bring on just any day of the week. Suffice it to say that I came up through the ranks, tried to find my own footing and my own voice, began making photographs, and all the time were sort of to some degree at the mercy of the of changing technology. So I took up digital photography about 1985. This is at a time when um, was pre-Photoshop, which didn't come on the line. I had things. There were no grayscale or, or color monitors. You could show type on a screen. You couldn't show anything else. You could show black and white on a monitor screen. 72 dots per inch was the affirmed resolution of everything. And you worked with an image writer with a, with a typewriter ribbon. This is my friend, David Bales. This is a photograph made with a small bank surveillance camera. Uh, they're easy to come by, you just go into the bank. They don't think you're gonna take those things. You just <laughs> grab the camera and you're free. 
the camera would take a picture in grayscale, which, and the earliest Macintosh, which is what made digital photography possible because Macintosh had a pixel-based graphic system rather than a vector-based. Vector-based was great for making the shapes of alphabet letters, but you needed pixels to show anything other than letters on the screen. Macintosh let you do that. Macintosh was a black and white screen, the first one. So you fed in the grayscale image, which was immediately reduced to black and white. And thanks to a program called Mac Paint, which was a 72 dot per inch program, everything you made was 72 dots per inch, you could convert the picture from grayscale to black and white dots. And in light areas, there would be a lot of white space between the dots, black spaces, there would be less. But this is David Bales with that camera. And from there, uh, this is a full frame picture from the digital, from the camera in Yosemite, not that you can quite tell it because the resolution was so low. But the first thing I realized is if you put, if you took a panorama, if you took two pictures and put them side by side, the pixels looked smaller because you stood back further to look at them. And you could keep adding to the panorama again and again until eventually you would come out with something that had the vague facsimile of being a recognizable photograph. And I saw myself as an explorer in rare territory. I took this camera up to Yosemite and uh, I won't go through the rigmarole that was involved in getting the pictures uh, using that to plug in camera. Um, but uh, this allowed me to make a photograph that, how to put it, in the, in the way that I anthropomorphize everything, I imagine myself as being I imagine what a Mars lander, a lander sent from Mars to Earth, that had somehow settled into Yosemite Valley, opened up its hood and began taking a panorama of robot pictures of this foreign planet, what the planet would look like. And this is what I came back with. And so this was just at about the time that the Voyager spacecraft to Mars was making the first photographs of Mars. So I figured I was making the first Martian photographs of Earth. I always have some sort of a little handle on, on my thinking. Uh, everything has a, a grounding to it. I'm not interested in creating something that never existed before per se. I'm interested like Jerry Yulesman is in creating a cosmology where everything fits together. It's like the answers you get depend upon the questions you ask. And if you ask what would the, what would the Martians see if they came here and then you work at it, this is the answer you come up with. So from there, and again, this will just be a real, real quick little thing. Uh, uh, these were my earliest landscape photograph, uh, which I put in the little graphic of the edge of the Tri-X film and then put myself in first multiple image photograph, so on. Uh, things got a little bit better as time passed. Again, uh, when scanners, Apple came out with a grayscale scanner about 1988, and you could lay an eight by 10 photographic print on the scanner and it would scan it at 72 dots per inch, but, but you could get a lot of inches out there and which I could then uh, reduce to this and I could change the sky with a little bit of, little bit of control you had in Mac Paint to change it into what I saw as imagined as kind of the isobars of a weather map. So this is a California palm tree. They're, they're, this is the way they look here in California. Uh, and then I put in the sky up here at, or replaced the sky in a manner that made it look like one of those weather maps you see on the evening TV and then did the same thing down here. You have to carry through on the details. As things got a half step more advanced, I found I could make a print on mylar of the image on the screen, contact print it in the dark room, come out with a positive print, black and white print, still 72 dots per inch, but this is gelatin silver. Then having the gelatin silver print, I could take oil paints and hand paint color into the scene. So taking slowly taking these steps away from 
from straight analog and into digital was this long process of getting the resolution high enough, getting a printer that could print things out. When Macintosh one, Roman numeral one came out, it had a grayscale screen. You could actually render things in grayscale. And at that point, I found that I could take Holga pictures, scan them together, scan them one by one on a scanner, bring them into the computer and print them out as grayscale photographs. And it kind of goes on from there where, but I think I'm trying to leap forward too fast in all of this. Um, and I think I've reached the end of my time. You, I know are heartbroken that we ran out of time, but I'm thrilled while you were working so hard, uh, you should have seen the chats come flooding in uh, like, Ted, Ted, don't leave us, don't leave us, keep going. Keep going. I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, end on your beautiful burned cactus down there. Oh, this, this. Yeah, yeah. This, I mean, this, is, yeah. this is, this is Ted's, oh my God. I well, mean, this, this is, yeah, again, you, lacking the lead in, but suffice it to say that I, I studied uh, solar plate uh, gravures for two years with Robin Smith at MPC and I for a while I was making pictures uh, you know I'd st start with a photograph and convert it into a solar plate gravure and so on and eventually I swung back again where I'm no longer using my printing press that you can see in the background of this of the scene that I'm in um, I've gone back to staying entirely on the computer side but comma, I've taken away a lot of the attributes of printmaking that I learned to love, one of which was that sort of sense of a 19th century, uh, 18th century Audubon print uh, uh, and tried to emulate the feelings that people were getting. Show us a couple more. Days. And you notice even that what Maggie Taylor has been doing with her pictures, you notice that she didn't take current pictures of people and put them into her scenes. She went back in time to the 19th century where somehow people faces look different, people pose differently. You know you're in a different world with, with Maggie's pictures because she is literally show, taking parts of a different world and bringing them to you. It's a huge unanimous thumbs up, Ted. We're gonna, Michelle will come a call in and we'd love to have a, a standalone lecture about your incredible life uh, with Ansel and Jerry Yulsman and all the rest. Thanks for letting me come on board at all. I appreciate that. Go forth and multiply.